me, my friend Kathy Hammer. Kathy. Um, she's going to be sharing some stories and um, talking while I cook. Oh, I'm not. Uh, I'm Kathy Hamlin. I'm quite active in the city within our community, Indigenous community, uh, as well as just a community at large. I have done a lot of uh, recently, well, my most recent venture is working with the multicultural group of people through the city of Edmonton. And uh, so it's been quite the interesting journey. Uh, I'm after originally from Treaty 8 territory, northern Alberta, further north from here. I grew up in uh, Peace River, in Peace, in Peace River, and I grew up on wild on on the you know, like on all the wild food, wild meat, and all the plants and everything that grew nearby our home. So I, I know quite a bit, and I will be uh, explaining some of the, the like some of the seasonal things that happen like right now, most, most happy season is almost over. And why is that? Like I'll be talking about stuff like that if anybody wants to know. And there are a few items, that, uh, vegetables that Crystal ha has brought with her to cook. And I have P names for them if anybody wants to know what they are. Crystal herself just learned what they're called. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I was supposed to do the elk. Elk too, but I found I had more meat in my freezer than the elk, so I have some. I already chopped up my meat, it's missed meat, and um, yeah. So I will be adding some onions and frying it before I put it into my hot water to simmer. So I will be chopping my vegetables first. So you want to talk about meat meat then? Oh, you could, what's the key name for this? You want to start with that? Oh, onions. Onion. We see that means stinky grass. Stinky grass. That's the Cree name for that? Yeah. We see that. Say it again. Say it again. We see that. Wave C, task C. Yeah. Oh, you said that. Perfect. Who was that? That's him. That's a sim, awesome. yes. Well, I mean, people who speak multiple languages have a have a knack for picking up real quick, right? Getting the diction down pat. Yeah. Uh. Okay, so uh, Crystal, I have a question. I'm going to be the uh, person uh, passing on questions coming in uh, from the chat. So Jim, um, our, one of our board members actually, uh, he uh, is asking, maybe you can tell us a bit about the differences between beef, elk and moose uh, meat in terms of you know, how they're used in the cuisine and also their uh, Cree names too. We're learning Cree tonight, that's great. You want to talk about the difference between moose, elk, and beef? But I think people could stop asking. Well, actually, we prepare them all the same. Like the way you would prepare beef, right? Uh, cooking with making stew. Pretty basically the same. Basically the same as elk and, and moose meat. We would, uh, you know, like cut it up and throw it in the pot, fry it up first. Um, uh, we smoke it. We have to get really large rolling papers. Actually, like we smoke it, we make smoke racks, right? Uh, and, it, and that's how we make dry meat with moose meat and elk. And that'll last us like, usually from from the from summer to the fall, of, at least one year. All the foods that we prepared and all the foods that we harvested. Would should would have lost us anywhere from six months to a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so J Jim is asking, um, is the but uh, uh, how are the meats themselves different from each other? Are they actually different when you cut it up? I mean, maybe texture, uh, yeah. 
color, things like that, are they similar or, or are there differences? The color is, is, is the color is is the same. Uh, the texture is slightly different, right? I think it's uh, and moose meat is a little bit darker than beef. The, the meat itself is a little bit darker. Uh, elk is the same. But it's a little bit darker, and elk is quite a bit is is more tender. Elk and and. Uh, the taste between the three of them is just like, it's so different. You can tell the difference between moose meat and elk meat when you're accustomed to it and beef. And we were just talking earlier about that. Like, we don't know how, what they put into their beef these days, but it sure doesn't taste anything like moose meat or elk. And because our wild meats don't have a lot of uh, steroids or other chemicals, they're more filling. They're more nutritious, right? They have more nutritional value. And uh, my 14 year old granddaughter mentioned this last week. I went and took some uh, elk, elk, uh, elk meat to them. And, you know, I just made uh, elk meatballs uh -huh. and took them to, to my daughter's place. And my 14 year old granddaughter, who would never get school, she was like two, three, three Big Macs a day. She had a couple of meatballs and she said, gee, how come? She said, how come? No food means grandmother, right? She said, gee, no food. She said, how come? Every time he eats more meat, she said, I eat so real quick. And she said, and they stay full for a long time. And I told her because it's not full of chemicals. It's just natural food, natural ingredients. Yeah, I mean, that's that's wonderful. So I have one more question. Um, it, how high should the heat be to fry the moose meat, and how long would it, would would I fry it approximately? Um, I have it on like the highest setting, but that's just because I'm not used to this. So normally it would be medium high, and I'm just frying it to brown it before I put it into my pot of water, boiling water to simmer, and it depends. <laughs> How big, how, how small you chop them as well, how long you simmer it. I made mine fairly small because I'm on time limit here. Sometimes I simmer my meat for up to four hours. I see. Okay. So you're going to stir fry it with the onions for a little bit and then yeah. later put it in the pot in boiling water. And yeah. for now, again, I'm just repeating in terms of the answers uh, so people can hear uh, us. So uh, right now in the EIC kitchen, she started off with the highest setting uh, possible, but mostly because uh, uh, she's not you know, that familiar with the, the stove over there. Uh, and she's gonna kind of reduce it to uh, more towards a medium heat um, afterwards. I'm gonna make that next. I'm gonna talk about the I'm gonna start cooking the pork here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Kathy will talk about that. I'm gonna start making my bannock shortly. My yeah. oven heating. It's a four, four fifteen. My oven, and she'll talk a little bit about bannock. I'm gonna bake some because we can't fry any in this kitchen. Um, so Kathy will just talk a little bit. Perfect. So I will I will repeat that again for our uh, viewers for tonight. Uh, Crystal is soon going to uh, start uh, preparing the bannock tonight. We're making baked bannock because uh, she's cooking at the EIC kitchen, and unfortunately we can't deep fry there. Uh, but uh, I uh, she tested it yesterday. It was looking amazing. So baked bannock, I'm sure, will be equally tasty. So 415 degrees is uh, what she set up the um, oven for. It's heating up right now. Um, and uh, I do have uh, one more question with the, the onions that you're using. Uh, is it yellow onions, red onions? Does it matter? Um, I, I always use yellow. I, don't, I, I like the yellow onions. Okay. Yellow <laughs> onions mostly uh, is what they use. All right. Okay. Okay, we'll start the banning, but she'll talk about banning. Um, yes. Okay. Oh, bannock is bannock is our food staple, and it, it it became our food staple when the Canadian government deliberately tried to starve us out. 
so they could claim all of our lands and make way for the railroads and whatever, and make way for the settlers. So the Canadian government and Canadians, settler Canadians, were very aware that the Canadian government did in fact try to starve us out. And uh, one of the first things they did to, to, to achieve that agenda was, well, they killed out all our buffalo. But anyways, the bandit became our food staple. Uh, bandit was introduced to us by European men, particularly the Scots, who came from Scotland, along with the Irish men, working for the Hudson Bay Company. And uh, a lot of our, uh, maybe a, lo a lot of the Scotsmen took uh, indigenous women as their wives. Same with the Irish. And so, um, and the French. But that it came from, from the Scotsmen who worked uh, for the Hudson Bay Company. And the reason it was, it became so popular for us was, with us was that, First of all, it was sustainable, right? And it was portable. And uh, you could feed a lot of people with bannock, like a, a slab of bannock with the size of, of the pan that uh, Crystal is using right now could probably feed a public. Like, if people eat, eat it regularly, ate it, right? They, uh, the amount that Chris is making right now would be enough to feed up to 10 people. Yeah. And considering that we had large, large families. Mm -hmm. So something that could feed 10 people and there's nothing else left would become very valuable to us, right? Of course. And even when the Indian, Indian agents would uh, hide the, the ingredients for making the, the, to make the ballot, they'd hide them and they and lock them up in storage sheds and they would eventually get moldy. The flour would eventually get moldy and but he still he still used it anyway because he didn't have much of a choice. So Bannock had his mom all the food staple and we we uh, we love it, we adapted it because uh, the way the Scots made the bannock was the uh, the ingredients are the same. So it's quite different in the way we make, we make it. And we adapt it to the way we wanted it. Oh, the best thing about bannock, I don't know of any other baked uh, food that you can just adjust it and make it to your personal taste. Some people like their bannock really fluffy, like baked bannock, really thick and fluffy. Um, me, I make mine really thin, like the crust is real crusty bannock and then thin. And uh, my mother and my gun, my, my mom and my aunties and my grandmother used to feel sorry for me because they'd say, you know, Kathy can do a lot of these things that none of us ever did, but she still doesn't know how to make them. They didn't understand and they didn't think like, that's how I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, uh, Crystal, I also don't want to miss the, the actual process. It's rather simple, and I'm going to uh, share the recipe once again in our chat area. But basically what you did was um, about five cups of flour, right? Let's repeat the process too for the people. And then also while you're repeating, uh, Jim is asking the question I asked to you yesterday. Is it, diff is this, is it a different recipe to do the baked bannock versus the fried bannock? It is, yes. For the fried bannock, um, all I use is flour and baking powder to make my dough, and then I fry it in oil. Whereas for this one, I use baking powder, salt, and flour. Some people also add sugar. Some people actually use lard instead. A lot of people do use lard instead of oil. I use oil because it's a, healthy, a little bit healthier for, for like diabetics. And um, so I mix those. The dry, then I added my oil and more water, very warm water, made my dough, and then I put it in my oven at 415 for about 20 to 25 minutes. 20 to 25 minutes. Uh. Okay. 
And when you're making the dough, um, in terms of uh, like the, the softness, the hardness, the, what's the texture? It's like a, um, how soft or how, how uh, hard the dough would normally be? It would be quite soft. Um, the, the more you handle the dough, the harder and it will be and the harder your bannock will be. Okay. So the less you handle it, if I, if I had picked it up and held some of it, it would have, the rest would have fell down to it because it was so okay. soft. So, so soft. The, okay. yeah, the more you handle it, the, the, your bannock will be a little bit less fluffy and a little harder. But I'm just chopping the vegetables for my stew. I don't know if you want do you want to finish doing the cream words for the my vegetables? Oh, okay. All right, we will do that. So these are turnips or rutabaga. They're commonly known as rutabaga, but they're turnips. And I don't think turnips were our traditional vegetable either, neither were the other onions. The onions. Yes. <coughs> Then those were European imports. Uh, but the, the word for uh, turnip, the Cree word for turnip is mitsi fan, meaning, meaning it, it, it looks like a belly button and it's shaped like a belly button. And, you know, uh, if you take a good look at it, so that, that's what it means. Like, it, it, it looks like, it looks like uh, a belly button. It's and, and it grows in, in the earth, right? And that's the connection to Mother Earth and how everything is connected to Mother Earth. Interesting. Okay, I still have a question about the bannock. Uh, okay. Can you put milk in it too? Sorry, I can't hear you, Sam. Can, uh, can you put milk in the bannock? as well is a question for um, uh, some people. I've seen people do it, yes. And it's more, that makes it more of a biscuit, biscuity, yeah. flake, makes it more flaky. Okay, I great, so. So they can, I will they write that in. For the shortening, they can also use margarine or butter. Yeah. And again, it, it, it's not, like I said, and then it's more like the traditional biscuit that the uh, Scots, the Scots people made, right, the scones. So that's why, like I said, we adapted our, our bannock. And then, you know, you, you can, you can, that's, and also that it's, and that it's so flexible. You can, you can make it according to your personal taste. I don't have any other big stuff that you can do. Oh, like adding cheese to it or yeah. raisins or whatever. Oh, raisin bannock, or raisin bannock and corn. Yeah. Whole corn, like, you know, corn, corn, corn. I've never tried that. Yeah, in the fried bannock. Oh. It's delicious in the fried bannock. You put, you know, the whole, the whole, uh, whole, whole corn. 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 Okay. Corn corn. Corn. Just get a can of corn, corn, of corn, and just throw it in your, in your bag or your, your fried bannock bag. Delicious. <laughs> Wonderful. So for now we're working on the stew. So uh, we have turnips that's going in it. Carrots. Celery. Celery. Okay. Potatoes. And potatoes. All right. So they, uh, I have people that love the raisin idea. So they're going to try the raisin bannock next time. <laughs> Very good. So, um, how about, how about the vegetables? Were these vegetables that you guys are using um, uh, like uh, uh, native to uh, the the lands of of Canada, or were they brought from outside as well? Do we know those? These versions of the onion. Uh, and, and these, as far as I know, as far as I know, but don't quote me on this. There might be people who know, who might give you more information on it. But so as far as I know, so as far as like, as far as I know, the the onions and the turnips uh, and the celery are not native. 
I see. To, to, to yeah. Uh, you know what? I, I know that um, we have one of the right? And uh, they taste different than what than these ones. Yeah. I can't do, I, I can't remember, I've never had any, right? but I just remember uh, my grandchildren to talk about the wine onions. That's going way, way back. Yeah, that's kind of true. I had yeah. Me too. This is what we grew up on. Yeah. I know that with the cat brushes. Oh, the castles, you know, the bulrushes? Do you know the bulrushes? Do you know what those are? Castles, if you know them, they grow in marshland. They have little puffy, puffy little tops. Uh -huh. uh, and they're brown and it's quite a And you go to the bottom of that, the root of that uh, looks like an onion. Oh, but it doesn't see. taste like, an, like these kinds of onions. And they taste really different, like so different. They're not even close to what these onions taste. Um, it's really hard to describe it if you've never had it. Mm -hmm. And it's just like this one mint tea, right? Mint tea. This mint grows in marshland and it grows anywhere there's water, like lakes, rivers. Mm -hmm. And this tea, we make a tea out of it. People like it sometimes. A lot of our people prefer to, uh, just a minute. A lot of our people prefer to, uh, can you see it? Yes, we can, yeah. Uh, yeah, perfect, yes, okay. yes. So a lot of our people prefer to mix it with, say, red rose tea or something, right? But oh, I, I do what drinking it as just by itself as a medicine. Um, is it to me? And, and it's medicinal property. Or like, you know, when you have a cold, you get all clogged up and then uh -huh. that's congested. Then you drink the mint tea and it'll it'll help ease, the, ease those symptoms, help ease off those symptoms. Uh -huh. So yeah. So I have a question from our viewers. They're asking, do you harvest bulrush uh, roots in a certain time of year or when they're underwater or dry? Everything we harvest, we harvest according to the seasons. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. Just overall, like uh, in the springtime or late in the fall is the best time to harvest grass food. Okay. I think it's yeah, or up to the fall from from like uh, the summer and the fall is when we do most of our plant harvesting. Oh, I see. Yeah, and, and the bull rushes is where we get our sure bought my rat food. The bull rushes is where we get what we call rat food, but it's commonly known amongst uh, other peoples. It's commonly known, like with the settler, the European people, it's commonly known as bitter root. And uh, root. yes, we okay. call it rat root, but it's actually known as bitter root okay right. uh -huh. um, um, and it's and its equivalent is uh ginger root it has the same property oh i see so similar to ginger root it doesn't look anything like ginger root mm -hmm. but it has the same property i see i see so this rat root or bitter root was our our very own neo citrine. It took care of aching pains. It took care of our headache, decongestion, the decongested us, and uh, to, and it reduced our fever. Oh, so wonderful. you find you find that where you go, bull rushes grow at the bottom. That's where they grow. Uh -huh. Really hard to find for us. That's like gold. Somebody give me some gold. Oh, we can still see it and good thing. Okay, so um as as we're making these, I, I also have some general questions. So 
Um, it was wonderful. The whole, you know, what how you explained Bannock, how Bannock came into uh, the indigenous cuisine, basically as a need to survive. Uh, but um, also, tell us a little bit generally, for instance, uh, what would indigenous people eat, let's say, for breakfast versus uh, dinner, you know, at different times? What would they eat on a day-to-day -day basis? Are there special foods that people would make on special occasions for celebrations, things like that? Nope. We'd all eat it. We'd all eat everything that we could. And there are now there are special foods that we eat for specific uh, ceremonies. Uh, like salmon mixed with, with blueberries, uh, that's specifically for ceremonies. Um, uh, and then um, there's a tea, the muscate tea, commonly known as Labrador tea, but it's muscate tea to us because it grows in the muscate marshland. Uh, in the winter time, there were there was a ceremony. I don't want to get too much into ceremony, a wood ceremony, because there's some protocols that I don't have to respect. Okay, and you really want to know more about stuff like that? Start going to ceremonies instead of asking. Them. Participate. Come to our ceremonies. Participate. When you're invited to go to a ceremony, if I ask you, just come. Right. A lot of ways and I'm having quite a bad day. You want to really learn who we are, how we live, why we do the things we do. Come live amongst us for a couple of days. So like I, I, I don't want to get too much into ceremony, ceremony. Just generally, we didn't have breakfast time, we didn't have lunch time, we didn't have supper time. We ate when we were hungry. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Makes yeah, sense. Makes I'm, sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, again, I want to make sure um, our viewers are um, kind of, you know, we're interacting with them too. So Sandy, going back to the Bannock again, she just wants to reiterate, saying that um, what she's hearing is that Indigenous people often had these simple ra rations of flour, shortening, and baking powder, and this is how Bannock got introduced to their food culture, is this sort of... Uh, True, right? That's what she's trying to verify. That's all what I'm trying to say. That is exactly what I said. Okay. And then uh, un unrelated comment from uh, Brad, going back to uh, Bull Rush. Uh, so is it the same flavor as ginger is what they're asking? No, it's different. It's totally different. Like I can't explain. See, okay. If somebody like comes to ask me, like what does that wild mint taste like? Because uh, Crystal is a bush girl, right? If uh -huh. she asks me, what does that taste like? I would say it tastes like bush life. And she would know what they mean, right? <laughs> she'd say, oh, well, what does ginger, what, what does rat taste like? And I go, it tastes like it tastes like marshland, right? Uh -huh. And she would know what I mean. So like as far as describing, I have that, I could do, I could describe it, but I can't. You know what I mean? But this wild mint tastes a little bit like garden mint and, and a little bit like peppermint, not quite, but it has a distinct flavor all unto its own that just like, it smells, it tastes like earth, it tastes like bush life, it tastes like, like you'd have to have a little bit of it and you you wouldn't know what I mean because you don't live didn't grow up in the kind of bush country that I did but you would know that it's you would know that it's a distinct taste and it's a taste you will never forget okay, okay. wonderful so uh Carrie is basically saying again just like you said before uh they, they weren't really established times for breakfast, supper. People were eating when they're hungry. So uh, Carrie said, I still eat when I'm hungry, uh, which is all the time. Me <laughs> too. <laughs> well, you know, because I live, I live by myself though. So like when, my, when I was bringing my kids up, I had, to, I had to live like everybody else did by the clock. The clock was my guardian. Oh, kids have to eat at eight. They have to leave school at eight for school at eight. The clock was mine. 
guardian. And it drove me crazy because I did not grow up like that, right? So anyways, well, now I live by myself. I have my own apartment and I live by my, and you know what? If I feel like having breakfast at one in the, at one in the afternoon, I have breakfast. I got up in the morning, I had coffee, I had fruit or whatever. But if I want a real good breakfast, I'll have my good breakfast. If I want to have my supper at eight at night, I have it. Because that was how we lived. Uh -huh. When we were all hungry as much as we worked, and, and our days were full of work, mm -hmm. right? Good work. So we would get hungry, but we weren't, like I say about what my granddaughter said, we weren't constantly hungry. Sure. I mean, also when you're busy, that's the thing, when you're working, you're not always thinking about food. So uh, I understand, but I, I love your, what you said about, uh, you know, almost being a slave or being a guardian to, to a watch, to, to a time. So living in nature, uh, that's in a way less stressful, your, your life, you're not worrying about these things. Yes. Just being in tune with the nature. Okay, wonderful. All right, so uh, what did we do with the vegetables, uh, Crystal? Are they in the pot already? Oh, yep. I added just the carrots and turnips for now because they take longer to cook. They take longer to cook. Okay. So uh, we j again, going back to what's in it right now. So it was just uh, water. The meat was fried with onions. Uh, we added the water. And there is nothing else right now. It's just boiling in water, and then the turnips and the carrots are in, right? I also added these beef cubes, flavor cubes. Oh, I see beef flavor cubes. Okay. And some people actually. When I was really young, I used to flavor our stew with, with just bay leaves and salt and pepper, and mm -hmm. that's it. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Yes. So that was what I used to have. And then people started using these beef flavor cubes uh -huh. as well. Some people use gravy or the beef stew mix. Oh, I see. And so we also used the barley. The barley, the bay leaf, salt and pepper, and that was it, and the vegetables and nothing else. Uh-huh. But now I love the beef stew flavoring. Because my kids prefer it that way. Sure. So I'll let, I'll let these vegetables simmer for at least 15 minutes. Um, before I add the potatoes and celery, that only takes a few minutes to cook. Okay. So at least 15 minutes, you said, hey? And uh, with the carrots and turn it because they, it takes longer to, to cook them. That's right. Perfect. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so here I have um, mixed berries, like cinnamon berries. They would be wild if I had any, but I do not. These are just frozen berries. But you have you have them with your bannock as a dessert. Okay, that's uh, dessert. Just uh, yeah. So people would uh, indigenous people would pick them from the nature normally, but right now the comfort of today's life, we just get frozen berries. Hey. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if people are hearing my uh, bell. I, we have a busy day at the, I see apparently I, the door bell is ringing. So I don't know if that passes on uh, through Zoom, but my apologies for, those, for that. Okay, so uh, Crystal, again, based on our conversation yesterday, uh, normally elk meat, that's why you kind of pre-cooked it a little bit. Um, how long would it have to uh, cook usually? About an hour, you, you said? Well, it depends. Um, it just depends how soft it is. You have to check it as you simmer it. Because... Um, some meats are just tougher, right? It's a tougher cut or whatever of the huh. meat or the salt. Like beef. Yeah. yeah, just like in beef. Based on age. Yeah, and based on age of, of the animal as well. Of course. So younger, younger, the meat, right? 
So okay. I don't know how old the meat is that I get. So I took it until I think it's almost done. That's my my vegetable. So, so exactly. So you need to check to see if if it's tender enough and it's ready. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Makes so sense. I don't, I don't add my vegetables until like my meat is close to being soft enough to mm -hmm. eat. Sure. So um, going back again with the stew, so this elk stew, uh, they would eat it alone or with the bannock or uh, what kinds of other things we might see, let's say, um, you know, eaten together with the stew. Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm, um, this is actually not, Sam, you didn't hear me on my set. I just, this is most. I, I, oh, I see, I see. Sorry, I may, yeah, I didn't hear that part. Sorry. Um, I usually have a lot of elk in my freezer. I just don't right now. So I brought the moose that was recently given sure. to me. Um, when we have our stew for potlucks and stuff, it's just the stew itself. Unless it's a feast where it's a number of different kinds of soups, like uh, heart, heart soup or moose nose, all those kinds of things. Okay. So you can you can you can pretty well eat anything. This thing is you can pretty well eat anything with the moose meat or the elk meat. Mm -hmm. Just like you can mix with beef, right? Roast sure. beef. You can mix mm -hmm. it with anything you want, side dishes. Oh. So, but I'm 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 trying to understand, especially uh, the bannock. Like um, you know, I'm. Um, uh, Turkish originally, it's kind of like bread for us. Anything like this stew, we always eat it with bread. So, are you going to be eating it with bannock as well? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. If we feel like it, we will. Like you know, and again, as far as like, how much time does it take? Again, we don't. When we're on our own, we don't allow the clock to be our guardian. Mm -hmm. So like. Like Crystal said, right? Like she come and check it and go, oh, okay, it's good to throw that in. We don't time our cooking. We don't time our how long this is gonna take. Because with experience, and, and I know most folks do the same thing, right? With experience, you know, you have a pretty good idea. You, by instinct, you know, oh, it's time to throw this in. Uh -huh. Right? So if you really wanted to know precisely how to cook, say, uh roast the roast moose meat. The same time as it would take you to cook beef, roast okay. beef, right? Mm -hmm. So anything that moose meat and elk is the same amount of time would take me to make, say, like this moose stew would take normally would take, the same amount of time would take you to cook a uh, beef stew. I see. Yeah. So it doesn't take any longer than um, any other meat necessarily. Perfect. Yeah. That makes no. sense. Okay. okay. Sandy says she can't wait to make the stew. I will definitely want to try that myself too. <laughs> So Elsie, uh, Elsie, I'm so used to working with my elder Elsie Paul, um, our grand community grandmother Elsie. Um, Crystal mentioned that you know it's we we also eat like there's heart we have heart stew and uh, moose meat soup, uh, moose stone soup. Those are all delicacies, and those are things we we before we eat it ourselves. We offer to our elders first the liver, the and even like with rabbits too, right? Like we eat rabbits, we eat wild wild rabbits. No. Mm -hmm. And whatever we especially when it's uh, for a feast food, the the choicest part of any any meat that we, we are preparing for the feast always go to the elders first. Of course, makes sense. Mm -hmm. so what do you think? My bannock is almost ready. I don't know how to adjust this camera. I just want to do it like the other mm -hmm. 
Uh, Crystal, again, I think uh, yesterday that was very interesting thing uh, that you mentioned. Oh, Banica's cooking wonderfully. Uh, you were mentioning uh, that there wasn't really a lot of spices uh, in indigenous cuisine, but there was a reason behind that, hey? Because uh, again, uh, not having things available. Can you tell us a little bit about spices and, and what you use? I just remember when I was young, my mom only used like the bay leaf or salt and pepper. Like we didn't have things like like any of this crazy stuff. Um, and I don't remember my mom ever using any spices. Mm -hmm. Like a long time. Nope, salt and pepper and the natural, the natural flavor of whatever was being cooked. And also, I was just to say, and also we smoked meat. Earlier, I mentioned that I was sitting down racks mm -hmm. that we had built these uh, meat racks. Mm -hmm. and, and we would smoke the meat. We'd keep it under, like, keep the, the fire going, you know, to keep the smoke going. It would take about two or three days, depending. Uh, fish, we would, uh, fish is really quick. We'd take a day and be ready to eat. You don't have to cook fish when it's been smoked. So we, we smoked beaver meat. We smoked. Uh, Elk, moose meat, rabbit, sometimes we just the best roasted them over or open fire. <laughs> like these are things that we don't have access to anymore because we live in the city. And so we have we have learned to appreciate all, all the little extras, all the little imported stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The gravy, the pockets, gravy. I mean, we had our own gravies too, but totally different, totally different textures. And so, uh, uh, we also would mix uh, the berries with some of the cooking to mm -hmm. use that extra flavor. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Pearl says you can also make uh, smoked meat stew, and that's very delicious too. Oh, dried meat stew. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's oh, I'm going, I'm going to one sec. I'm going to go home <laughs> this summer. We'll get some dry meat. To make dry meat stew. So, hi, Tristan. Okay. Hi, so, now uh, the celery and the potatoes are going in, right, Crystal? Yeah. Yes, because okay. my carrots and turnips are quite tender, not, not totally soft, but soft okay. enough, right? And then only about 15 more minutes, and it will be done. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Frank. So I, I have a question and, and it uh, it might be uh, a little ignorant in the sense that like all these other cultural communities that, uh, you know, showcased before they were talking about having, um, you know, the specialty stores from their cultures where you can find those ingredients like uh, all those smoked meats is almost like a business idea. Is there not an indigenous store where we can go and buy the smoked meat? No, no, no. That is something we we have to like, go out. The pit, the, the hunters have to go get the moose, and the moose has to be skinned and everything prepared on site, right? I and see. We, and we start working through the process of. Uh -huh. uh, of uh, preserve, preserving the foods that's going to last us for whatever length of time we need them to last us. So Pearl, Pearl wrote uh, that kind of answering my question saying moose meat is not federally inspected. So maybe it's that kind of process because there's not a like a food administration process of inspecting it. It's not possible to sell it in the store, say. Eh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, that's a pity. Um, I, I don't know that they should do something about it. Like, we should be able to get the uh, smoke. No, 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 we don't. They, no, we don't they, 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 they have regulated us to death in the process of assimilating us. Okay. Uh -huh. Like, we have to draw the line somewhere. So, it's some of I our. See. And some of even. Even some of when you ask about ceremony, like what, what do we use for food and stuff, and like I have to be really mindful and respectful of, of, of certain, you know, of our people. And uh, 
I, no, I totally understand it. Of course, the the, the regulation uh, it might danger the you know if there's too much demand, the balance in the nature, things like that. So maybe if we miss it, we just need to go. Uh, you know, you, when you miss uh, smoke meat, you need to go to the reserve and find it there, etc. Eh? They didn't have to be on the reserve. Yeah. So Never exactly. Sandy is saying the same thing. Wild animals would go extinct. We don't want it to be. Yeah. Uh, in the yeah. stores for anybody to go out and buy these. Oh, I see. Excuse me. I need to correct you on something. We uh -huh. didn't all walk on a reserve. Uh -huh. Not all indigenous people are First Nations people. First uh -huh. Nations refers to people who belong to a reserve or who, you know, who are band members to a reserve. Uh -huh. And a lot of us band members, a lot of us band members did not grow up on a reserve. Uh -huh. uh, we lived, I, I, I lived in town after my grandparents moved us into town. But in the summer, we would go live in the bush until school started mm -hmm. or until the season was over or whatever, right? And so my grandparents, people who lived in town, we had to make, uh, we had to adapt the ways. We had to figure out how ways. For example, and now that you brought this up, for example, one of the preserve, best preservative, preserved food that we have is uh, uh, pemichan. People say, oh, pemmican. It's pemichan. And, and it's uh, ground, dried moose meat, like uh, powdered moose meat. We, we take the dry meat after smoking it several days to dry it. We don't have to cook it. We can just eat it like that once it's out and dry. And then you, you would pound it into a powder. Mm -hmm. And we would throw in blueberries or some other berries. Because my grandmother always used uh, Saskatoons, because where we grew up, there's an abundance of Saskatoons. And uh, ground that up, mix a little bit of, uh, mix it with uh, the, the moose fat, right? Mm -hmm. the, the moose fat, the natural fat on the moose, mm -hmm. and put a little bit of sugar to give it a little bit of flavor. Oh. And so, uh, you know, these, like the small little baggies that they have, if you fill that, uh -huh. Yeah, little baggy like that. If you fill that up with baby fun, that would uh -huh. be enough to you for a month. Just wow. You. And you would only eat about um, uh, a tablespoon, half a day, tablespoon a day. Wow, so it's so nutritious, of course. Food, not just by itself, but it would. But so I would always talk about this baby fun, and one time my grandchildren wanted to. Uh, Check it out. People like, no, come, you're always talking about this baby count because my, my grandchildren are all city born and bred. And and I said, Well, you know what? I said, We don't have, uh, I don't have, since my uncle passed away, you don't have access to our meat anymore. So um, easy access. I said, So what I did was I roasted, oh, uh -huh. uh, I roasted steak, beef steak in the oven, uh -huh. right? And uh, until not not more completely cooked, just like, and then I took the rest of it and cooked it on the stove top mm -hmm. until it was really really dry, mm -hmm. and then I shredded it like like I chopped it up really fine with the meat with the meat uh, cleaver, mm -hmm. and then I just like chopped it up as fine as I could possibly make it on the cast iron frying pan on top of the stove. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, I had dried up my blueberries for about two days. Because when you dry blue, when you dry berries, you have to turn each berry over, put it outside in the sun, right? We used to have to turn each berry over. But you know, today we have frozen frozen uh, bear blueberries, which is cool. And just let them dry out on my counter, burn them every now and then. But so I mixed all that up: the the baked the baked beef, the baked uh, uh, steak meat. Uh, beef steak, blueberries that I dried on my kitchen counter, and, and a little bit of sugar. And because this beef steak had no fat, I don't know why, don't ask me, but yeah. So I put, mixed it with a little bit of Crisco, and that was a baby fun. And I gave it to my grandchildren, and now they ask for it all the time for their lunch. So like, we have to work with what we have, right? Of course, of course. Oh, Bannock is done too, looking great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Make sure she 
she gets a piece of this bag and pick up. Yeah, this is almost done as well. Well, I'll just let it cool there for a couple minutes. We're still waiting for this to simmer. We're actually almost done, like 10 more minutes and we're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is going to be quick. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a quick meal. In an hour, just homemade bannock. Pearl said, <laughs> that's a beautiful bannock. <laughs> Thank you. We can't we can't transfer uh, things over Zoom yet, you know, food. But uh, people, a lot of people tell me they can almost smell it. So the amount of food that you put here is small. Crystal, how can you use food with its feet? Well, I put in my household at least seven. Yeah. So if you, have ten to fifteen, if you have to. Yeah. And then I usually make a bigger pot like yeah. when I cook. I use yeah. a huge pot and I make big bananas like that yeah. because you want to be able to feed anyone something here. Don't worry. Yeah, you never know who's going to come through your door. So you always have to have that extra food. Yeah, this is a small pot. I never use this pot. Well, I do know because I'm a farmer myself. I use a pot this size and I just freeze whatever's left over. Mm -hmm. But bannocks like this in a household of six people, it's gone. Hey, there's no left. No such thing as leftover bannock. I no can imagine that. Oh. That's looking great. We signed on a watch and you. Okay, let me see if there are any more questions from our um, audience, if there's anything I have uh, missed. Um, okay, I have, uh, Karen says, uh, I'm afraid I was late to the show today. Uh, is the early part of the show, the Bannock creation available to view later? Uh, we do have the recording, uh, Karen, on YouTube. But while we were talking and chatting, um, uh, Crystal actually made it on the side. So there's not really uh, specific step-by-step -step instructions, but it was very simple. So I'm just going to repeat. She said, uh, I mean, and the recipe is on our website. It's basically just about uh, mixing the dry ingredients together and um, slowly adding the oil and the water. And then it's not, you need it, but not for too long. I'm kind of repeating it for one of our uh viewers uh, crystal so you're needing it but not for too long if you need the bannock for too long you said it makes it too hard right crystal yeah that's right unless you have a, the better the, the less you handle it the, the better and oh, then yeah. uh you just basically preheated the oven to 415 420 degrees and then cooked for about 20 25 minutes until it was slightly brown pinkish brown kind of thing so what but we will have the recording on youtube on our youtube channel yes. uh and then i have millie asking do you eat bannock plain or is butter added uh like the way europeans eat bread yeah you can put whatever you like when i put down on it um butter that's the, that's the most common thing people put on it but it is very much just like bread over here yeah, so um, again, uh, they, you know, with the berries, with jam or with butter. Um, so that was Millie's question. Uh, perfect. And Karen, again, uh, going back to the bannock preparation, people, before you arrived, people asked for the difference between fried bannock versus uh, baked bannock recipes. And essentially the difference is when you're frying it, you're not putting the oil inside. Uh, you know, the dough, because it's going to be fried in oil anyway. And then when you're baking it, there's a little bit of oil that goes into the recipe. And the whole recipe and the instructions actually is on our uh, website at the EIC website, edmontonitoculturalcenter.ca slash programs. Um, Crystal actually included not just the ingredients, but specific uh, instructions as well. So there's written instructions and then there'll be the video. 
Okay, so I have one of the viewers that's actually going to venture in uh, making the bannock tonight even. So Yvonne and Emma are going to try making bannock, bake bannock tonight. All right, I hope it turns out. Okay, yes, hopefully it will turn out well. So, how long did the berries simmer, uh, Crystal? Uh, for for a while, or I had them simmering for about half an hour. Half an hour. Okay, so it's. I had water, water to them. I ended up um, half a cup of water. That was just half a cup of water. Okay, no sugar. It's the sugar in the berries that's already that makes it sweet, eh? Yes. And ideally, if we could find uh, berries in the nature, you said Saskatoon berries, raspberries, blueberries, berries. Yeah. Berries. But, but if you can't find the wild ones, the, uh, then use frozen berries. So just simmer them with a little bit of water, and that's uh, that's basic dessert. Yeah. Wonderful. So our stew is ready as well. It is ready. Wonderful. Okay. Okay, and and uh, those of us that are watching and trying our recipes, actually, please do share what you make on social media, so we can share them on our Twitter, on our Instagram pages. Oh, that's looking great, wonderful. So uh, thank you, thank you so much. That was uh, a, a great demonstration. Uh, and uh, again, anything else? Uh, if anybody else wants to ask questions, or Crystal, uh, if there are anything else uh, you would like to share, both about the uh, uh, food that we made tonight, or uh, anything else? Uh, I just want to say thank you for um, inviting me to um, cook with you, and um, I'm very happy that my friend was able to. Come with me. Do you have any words to add before we close? No, I don't have much to understand. No, I'm just, yeah, you know, this is me. I really like this. This is very, um, I don't know. Like, I really enjoyed myself. And I do, um, there are a couple of things that I want to be clear there that I might have not been correct about. Because I don't want to misinform anyone. Uh, about the about the uh, like the the carrots and the celery and then the turnip. Well, I know for sure that the turnips are imported, and I know for sure that the celery and, and these onions. I'm not quite sure what wild onions are because my grandparents used to talk with them, and I've never had wild onions. Why did I don't I don't remember what they were, but I know we do. And also, yeah. One more thing I wanted to add about the bannock. We had our own, and, it, and, and the bannock that we had was like flatbreads, <laughs> similar to similar to the breads, but probably heavier. So it's just, you know, we had our own, we had our own form of breads. Just like bannock really was a game changer for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Crystal, again, uh, a lot of accolades are coming. Uh, thanks coming from uh, our viewers tonight. So much good learning while also seeing great food prepared. Thank you, says Jim. Um, it's smelling good. Thank you so much for showing us how to do this. It's really appreciated, uh, says Millie. Uh, thank you, yeah, thank you all so much. Loved watching you cook and hearing you chat about our culture. Thank you, ladies. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Pearl was asking because somebody said uh, it smells good, so she's asking, "Do you have smell or vision?" Vision. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, the smell, but you almost feel like it when it's cooking. I, I feel that way too. You can tell when it's cooking; it's smelling good. Uh, but okay. thank you so much. And Crystal, maybe just a few uh, final words. We really appreciate it as at the Edmonton Intercultural Center. But maybe a few uh, words also about creating Hope Society and uh, the kinds of activities you do. Uh, the pandemic has put a damper on some of the activities. But uh, if there's anything you want to mention to talk about creating Hope Society, that might be a okay. good time to talk about that too. Sure. Uh... We currently, two of our programs are offered via Zoom rather than in person. That would be our cooking, panic, and tea. And as well, um, learning our Indigenous history is offered on Zoom. And um, we, are, we have been uh, 
for COVID-19 relief, we've been um, providing food hampers for 90, um, 45 families and 45 elders, which we hope to continue uh, with continued funding. And um, that's about all. We, we have no in-person anything right now, but we have those programs running at the moment. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So again, I have one more person that says, good tips on Batek, looks lighter than the recipe I have been using. We'll try it tomorrow. Uh, so again, everybody watching, if you if you try the recipes, please do share your uh, photos uh, on social media, tag us, uh, YEG Intercultural Center uh, on social media or on Facebook, we would love that. And thank you very much. Uh, have a lovely evening. I will sign off for tonight since our Food is already ready unless uh, anybody has any questions. Yes, have a lovely, lovely evening. Thank you. Good night. So what did they learn? What did people learn here the most? They learned. Oh, wait, I, I don't want to uh, hang up before. You were saying, what did people learn uh, the most? Yes, other than about the balance. Like, what okay, so, about the balance? Okay, other, how are you balance? Okay. Other, other than about the bag, all right. So we're we're being tested right now, which is good. So uh, I can I can start. First of all, for me, it's very important. Again, be historically um, learning about how bannock came in to the indigenous cuisine almost as a survival thing, because um, there was unfortunately, uh, you know, intentional campaign to try to starve the indigenous. Uh, peoples of, of, of Canada. So uh, that's that's an important thing to be aware of. I think that's uh, that's key for me uh, for tonight. I learned that uh, it came mostly from Scotsmen. Um, so let's see if anybody else that's remaining online can answer the question. What else have you learned tonight? Besides balance, we are not, our people are not all about balance, okay? Of course. What did you learn? What, what did you learn the most about tonight? I have other things, but I'm, I'm letting to see if other people uh, have any other comments. Yes. So I have Millie that says, I was fascinated to learn about the traditional food like uh, bulrushes. Now I want to have a look in spring and see what they're like. I'm happy to learn about the traditional things. Uh, Kari says Cree words for foods. Uh, that's what she uh, learned. Let's see if anybody else uh, is saying anything else. I have uh, Brad says many indigenous foods come from the earth. Okay, for for me again, uh, one of the key things I enjoyed was how you uh, mentioned, you know, living in the nature and traditionally. Uh, you're not you're not guardians of of the clock the watch that you're actually you're actually yeah exactly it's like to, for, to me that's 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 a nice philosophy of living that's the philosophy uh that passed on that's right on yeah. so that was that was great to uh talk about that um sandy says i learned the in Cree, the vegetable turnip means a uh, plant that looks like a belly button, uh, so <laughs> adorable. So that was uh, that was adorable. She says, "Wonderful, that's great." And that's this is what all our event is about. It's not just the food that we learn, but we learn about these philosophies. We learn about the culture. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you for coming tonight, and have a lovely, lovely evening. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye bye. We have taken a couple of the belly buttons.